Pep Boys proudly presents NASCAR Inside Winston Cup. Considering what normally happens on this program, we thought it'd be safer now just to apologize in advance for the following show. Welcome to NASCAR Inside Winston Cup, the desert dusted edition of the program. Alan Bestwick here in our Charlotte studios. After the red eye flight back from Phoenix, we've assembled once again our expert panel of drivers to review what happened in Sunday's Durloop 500. We welcome to the program Michael Waltrip, driver of the nation's rent Chevy for Ultra Motorsports, Johnny Benson, driver of the Aaron's Pontiac for MBV Racing, and Ken Schrader, driver of the M&M's Pontiac for MB2 Racing. Actually, this weekend it was the dog food car. It was the pedigree yes. car. That started sixth and finished 40th. Yeah, we had a few problems. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. One was a flat and the other one was another flat that resulted in the, a little detour into the concrete up in turn three and four, but uh, we've had worse days there. Friday was <laughs> Friday. Friday. <laughs> Friday. <laughs> yeah. We well, can't show you the videotape because they haven't shown it on TV yet, but Kenny had a spectacular exit from the Southwest Tour race at Phoenix Friday. Yeah, I actually stayed in the track. I tried to get out. You I got out in. right in the middle of the crash. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. right. You'll have to look for that one on television at a later date. Johnny started fourth and finished 16th. Yeah, we sure thought Darren's Pontiac was going to be a little bit better than that, but it just didn't end up being that way. So just um, we started off okay. And just as the track was taking over, both actually me and Kenny started off pretty good and just um, hung out. And then after a little while, just, man, just couldn't get a hold of the racetrack. Pretty car you got, though, you know? Looks good. Aaron, 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 especially from up yeah. close like that. <laughs> uh, Mikey started 42nd and finished 32nd. You I'm charged moving. forward. You he, he gained spots on the day. I moved up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys had some false illusions that you were actually going to do good. Yeah. And I started uh, in the back and and finish there so <laughs> nevertheless I was disappointed this is Alan this video right here is yeah. one lap prior to Schrader hitting the wall he got down on the inside of me and ran a lap there and I was able to stay ahead of him and he went into the next turn and blew his tire out and hit the wall so I'm glad that um, I was ahead of you when that happened I would have missed you somehow. I would have done anything I could to miss you as I was flying home with you. <laughs> yeah. I would like to. This, this is the guy that always talks about eight tires being better yeah. than four. <laughs> I really wished I had I had to run better so I could make fun of Strader because I mean he he all the race fans I signed autographs at my trailer the other day. All of them were saying you got to get on Kenny for wiping out the whole field in the Southwest Tour race. I didn't Friday get that. I got a fourth of them. And, <laughs> and then, and then um, Saturday morning, or Friday morning, excuse me, his Bush car wrecked. And then Sunday, he wrecked his Cup car. So it'd be just a great week. time to kick a guy while he's down. But I'm right down there with him. So <laughs> we decided we wouldn't kick on each other today. OK. I sense a lot of energy in the room here. I yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. We played Brummy all the way home, and Buffy beat us. So. Yeah. Beginner's luck. Yes. Steve Park had problems too. Yeah. <laughs> he was with us. All right. He ran good though. Yeah, he ran good. <laughs> His problems started after the race. Yeah. Ours began when, when he we got, got to play with you guys. <laughs> yeah. All right. As good a time for a break as I can think of. We'll come back and start into the news of the week. Plus, we'll review the Winston Cup and Bush Series races from Phoenix and preview this weekend's action down in Homestead. NASCAR Inside Winston Cup is presented by Pet Boys. Cars like us, people love us. And brought to you by Lowe's Home Improvement Warehouse. Lowe's, improving home improvement. And Miller Lite. Grab a Miller Lite. It's Miller time. Time to check some of the news headlines of the week now on NASCAR Inside Winston Cup. Rusty Wallace set a new track record in Bud Pole qualifying at Phoenix Friday to win his ninth 
fast time trophy of the season, the top 14 qualifiers all ran faster than the previous record, which was only one year old. Ron Hornaday confirmed Friday as the new driver of A.J. Foyt's Conseco Pontiac for 2001. The two-time Truck Series champ making the jump to Winston Cup racing after a two-win season in the Bush Series. After being crowned Truck Series champion at the awards banquet Thursday night, Greg Biffle unveiled his new Bush Series mount for 2001 at Phoenix on Saturday, taking over Mark Martin's old ride with Granger's sponsorship coming along. Jerry Nadeau's Hendrick Motorsports ride will be sponsored next year by Delphi Automotive and the United Auto Workers. That announcement made in Las Vegas this week. The Michael Holligan sponsorship going away after one season. David Ift has taken over as the interim crew chief of the Kodak Chevy for Morgan McClure Racing for the final couple of races of the season. Danny Gill has already left to move over to Andy Petrie's team for next year. NASCAR last week released the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series schedule for 2001. 24 races up, including new stops at Darlington, the new Kansas track, and I thought most interestingly, South Boston, Virginia. The Daytona winter testing schedule also announced by NASCAR. Each manufacturer getting one two-day test, plus a rain date for its open winter testing on January the 8th of 2001. And Jamie Skinner, who has made a handful of starts in the NASCAR Bush Series and NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series, was arrested last Thursday night for violation of drug laws. The 22-year-old is the son of Winston Cup driver Mike Skinner, who said at Phoenix this weekend he was devastated by the news but had no further comment until he could find out more specifics of the situation. And we discuss some of the headlines now with our expert panel, Michael, Johnny, and Kenny. Phoenix qualifying Friday, two cars under 27 seconds, 14 under the track record that was only a year old. It, well, we just we see it every week, or most every week. They go back, and Goodyear's got. I think we had the same tires we had last year, actually. But everybody just got the bodies a little better, and driving a little harder, and cars working a little better, and we're just we're going faster every place. Rusty nine poles this season. Generally agreed by everybody that Penske seems to have the most horsepower right now, huh? He's well. He got both ends. I mean, Phoenix, you got to get around the corners too. And of course, they've had that program pretty good. And and with the horsepower that we're hearing that they have, man, doesn't hurt at all. It's November and we still have some rides not filled for next year. The Kodak car doesn't have a driver announced yet. Uh, got some drivers that don't know where they're going to be racing next year. How much different than normal is this silly season kind of running so late that, that we have as many things undecided into November as we do so far? I think it's very unusual. We usually have things uh, pretty well put together right now, know what's going to happen, but uh, it seemed like the whole silly season threatened to start early, but nothing really happened. And then all of a sudden, uh, into August and September, we heard some changes that were going to take place. So it's a little bit different. It's going to be interesting to see how it all falls together over the next couple of months as we prepare to head to Daytona for uh, winter testing in January. Anybody, uh, any further comments on the headlines? Daytona okay. testing That's schedule, truck schedule? I think the trucks are going to be cool to watch at Arlington. Yeah. We yeah. see what we we're get to run there in Bush. That's going to be pretty neat. Yeah. South Boston, too, I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Part of what the truck series was originally designed for, I've always been told, was to have a major event for some of these local weekly short tracks that run the weekly racing series every week. And to bring a truck race into South Boston, I think is very cool. So you think me and Kenny can get one at our tracks? I don't know about Peevely. I don't have dirt. Cool. But you a truck get race one. on dirt would be great. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it'd be great, that. but you could get one. I think you got to go get a NASCAR sanction for that thing every week first, John. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to work on that. Yeah. There's just a few details these cats are missing, but don't yeah. worry about it. Just move on. All right. <laughs> we will um, take a commercial break here and come back and get into our expert review of Sunday's Duraloop 500 at Phoenix. Don't go away. Racing Ward and uh, any of my teammates, Matt, and, uh, is not the thing that I want to do to have to win the race. I, you know, when you, when you, you know, I got to call Mark in the morning and say, you know, I'm sorry I beat you, you know, because um, they work so hard. They work just as hard as we do, if not harder. And, and 
uh, we work together to win races and, and you want them to win races as bad as you want to win races. So uh, it was fun to do, but at the same time, it's not fun to beat them. It's fun to win races, but it's not fun when you when you pit friend against friend or brother against brother. That's There's no fun in that because somebody's got to lose. Oh, I don't think Jeff was too disappointed at winning on Sunday in the Duraloop 500 at Phoenix. We come back now to begin our expert panel's review of the event now with Johnny, Michael, and Kenny. Here are the numbers on the day. 23 lead changes, pretty competitive event. Six caution flags, 23 of the 43 starters finished on the lead lap. Rusty Wallace and Jeff Burton were on the front row for the event, and they traded the lead three times in the opening 11 laps of the race. As we go to some of the early action now, Burton settled in out front after he and Rusty Wallace swapped the top spot back and forth. He set a pretty quick pace, catching the tail end of the field at lap 36. And when he caught the tail end of the field, there was trouble right in front of him. A potential win almost went out the door right there. Wow. That's, That's pretty, pretty close. close. I know what happened. I'll bet you do, as we will see in subsequent <laughs> looks at this. Well, Mikey, would you care to tell us? I was going to drive under that two car and that 32 decided he was going to drive under me, and that wasn't a good move for him. Well, he did pretty good not to take you out, though. He did. he did. Well, I did pretty good not down. to take the two out. And it's just, that's just real close racing there. And just about collects the leader. Just about as close. As exciting as that is, gets. <laughs> is, is this the level of expert analysis we're going to get here for the next 50 minutes or so? Well, that was pretty good video. That's self-explanatory. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Johnny. What's next? There's got to be another caution. The caution Something saved, the caution saved, saved several, including Dale Earnhardt, from being put a lap down. Earnhardt was running about 30th at the time, and the leader was coming up on him quickly. On the caution, the leaders all pitted. Video, please, as we look at some of the pit stops. And on this stop, Jeremy Mayfield, who was running 25th, took two tires. Yeah, I, was, well, I knew that. He took two tires and came out with the lead, I believe, or yep. second. He no, came he out with the lead. the lead. There he goes. Yes. And I think everybody was really going to watch to see what happened. Because we didn't run quite long enough to, to try it, but Jeremy thought, heck, what the heck, we'll try so, two tires and see what happens. And I think he ran pretty good with two tires. Go with your first instinct, Kenny. Yeah, well, it worked real good for him. You thought he had the lead, and then you kind of waffled, and then... Yeah, I thought he did. I knew he was way up there, but there was there was a lot of blue cars. There was the, the 2, yeah. the 12, the 02. I was confused. Jeremy took the lead off the pit stops, gave it up to Rusty Wallace for about 40 laps, then went back out in front on just the two tires. I was kind of surprised he was able to do that. He, he led about, what, 80 laps, having changed just two tires on that pit stop. Well, his, his race car was pretty good, too. I mean, that, that helps. And, and apparently, anything. the two tires either kept him freed up what he needed and worked out well for him. Tough luck, tough crash for Bobby Hamilton and Matt Kenseth. The <clears> next <throat> piece of expert analysis we will seek to get here. This is lap <laughs> number 52, turn one. Wow. Uh, well, what what uh, happened? Don't say what <laughs> happened. <laughs> There was, it didn't even look like there was any contact before all that something happened. Something broke on Hamilton's car. Well, something came out had the to back, be. and Matt ran over it with his right front tire. Yeah. Well, okay. So why do you ask us for? We don't have all these information. We, didn't see we it. saw the smoke. You could see a little bit of smoke there. Something and broke that. on Bobby's car, and Matt ran over it. That's exactly what happened. Okay, and luckily, no one else got involved. Whoa! Now, that was, that was close. close. That was we never did figure out how there. those cars usually, you know. One left could, side, one right front. Yeah, you're thinking, like, how'd that happen? Yeah, how did they do that? Not that we now couldn't we do something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no. How'd they do that? Yeah, nothing's impossible. Right. Uh, most of the leaders stayed on the track here. The cars from 17th on back, a bunch of them pitted and got fresh tires. Didn't really seem to help them a whole lot. Mayfield got into a hole during green flag pit stops for the leaders, which happened between lap 124 and 131. Rusty Wallace made the first move to pit road among the leaders at 124. Mayfield, whom you would figure is getting fairly similar fuel mileage to his teammate, tried to run another four laps. And it didn't work out. Rusty, the guy should have told them that they were close and running out. <laughs> Ran out of gas and uh, lost a lap. Came out uh, behind the leaders and was was running, running, trying to get the lap back when the caution fell. And fortunately, he was able to clip park at the line and get his lap back. Peter Suspenzo, the crew chief for the team, was not at the race on Sunday. He had two deaths in his family, a, a real uh, unbelievable situation for him. And certainly, we extend our sympathies to Peter.
effect there. Crew chief not there. Somebody not you know making calls that doesn't make the call every week. Maybe play into that a little bit. You would, you would hate think to throw somebody in the river like that, but it could have factored in there somewhere, wouldn't you think? Well, you you would you would think that between the two teams, they would have it figured out pretty well. Whether whether Peter was there or not, they would have the information they need to to make a call on how far to go on gas. So. There's a tons of things that could happen. The crew chief could have did, or the guy calling the shots could have done a perfect job and called just what needed to happen. But maybe the thing didn't get uh, full of gas, or maybe Jeremy on with the with the different tire schedule ran different speeds and times. So it's it's very difficult to point your finger at one situation as to why something like that happens because the mileage does vary, and um, you know maybe they just got a little bit worse mileage that run. Jeremy fell back to 26th position, one lap down in the race at that point. You know what I love? When the camera cuts back to me after these guys talk, they all look at each other and nod like, yeah, that was good, or no, oh, you well, were I was, wrong there. I was, thinking, I was thinking when someone was adding and subtracting and stuff, maybe like Missed they didn't carry the didn't one. Didn't carry the one. <laughs> yeah. we need to, that we happens need, a lot. You don't carry the a, one. We need to get a cutaway shot of, uh, of us no, when we, don't. we, had, when we no, answer we don't. a question. We're back here going, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> good job. It's just, it's just very subtle head nods, but the camera cuts to me and Schrader's over here going, <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. All right, Mayfield got his lap back at lap 146 when there's trouble in turn four. It is Rich Bickle who has the problem and leaves some debris behind him. A lot of debris. There was debris all over that racetrack. I mean, it was it was like a mine zone. There, there, there was, was stuff, stuff all over. Every Steve Parker almost track. didn't pit there. Pulled right in last minute. Cost himself the lead, I think, coming yep. in. Yep. And uh, cost himself the lead going out. But... Uh, he would have cost himself a lot more if he wouldn't have made that last dive to the pits there. Yeah, he almost missed the opening to pit road. Uh, a couple guys take two tires on this stop. Not pictured. Jeff Burton, Jimmy Spencer, Mayfield again, and Dale Earnhardt. I was surprised having run only 20 laps since the last stop and seeing how well Mayfield ran on the two tires early that more of the guys toward the end of the lead lap didn't try it. Yeah. I was yeah. surprised, too. We didn't, we didn't try two tires all day long, but it was uh, something that... Looked like it would be a good gamble if the guys really wanted to go for it, and they just didn't do it. But nobody did. Why? That's. Come on, experts. <laughs> Why? Well, I, I was struggling to keep up with four. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't see where two was going to be a big help. <laughs> okay. And also, a lot of times, Alan, if you want to make chassis adjustments, pull the rubber, uh, change the track bar, <clears throat> those things take extra time anyway. So if you do get two and make those adjustments, you're gonna. It's about the same as getting four. So you have to you have to try to figure out what your problems are and how you're going to address them. And air pressure changes too. Maybe you want to take put a, take a little air out of left sides or something. Those are some those are some things that go on during a Winston Cup pit stop. That maybe perhaps you didn't know <laughs> until you difference. tuned in today. <laughs> so now you do. Okay. Uh, let's talk weather conditions in the race. It had been overcast all weekend. <clears throat> then the sun came out about this point in the race, and it got fairly sunny, warmed up a little bit. It had been real overcast all weekend. I mean, we were we dodged a major bullet, according to the weather people, because it was supposed to rain all weekend, then it was supposed to rain Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then it was Saturday, Sunday, yeah. then it was Sunday, and it was overcast all weekend, and then Sunday afternoon, race time, after the start, bing, perfect weather. Sun came out, then it clouded over late <clears> in the race, then the sun came back out again. And I saw some cars like Dale Earnhardt. He was not good on the first run up to that first pit stop. Sun came out. He took off, ran all the way up into the top ten. Tony Stewart came up into the top ten. Then when the clouds came over, they just kind of leveled off. I think yeah. that's where our car, we were so good Saturday in practice. And the track wasn't taking any rubber. And it didn't look like it took rubber all, all day and even in a bush race. And then once the sun came out, the track started taking rubber. And we just couldn't get a hold of the racetrack. And then some guys, are, they were just in the opposite situation where... It, they got good when the rubber got on the racetrack. And then generally also, Earnhardt and those guys are, are good at adjusting their car. You know, we don't see him run, run great when he qualifies at times, and, and then when the first uh, pit stop comes around, they adjust that car, and they're usually pretty good with their adjustments, and they begin, they, they get competitive, and that was certainly the case yesterday. Let's talk about tire trouble. We saw Rich Bickle's problem there a minute ago. Mr. Schrader and Rick Mast both had two separate tire problems during the day. What was going on? Well, the first one we think that uh, we just cut it down, ran over something. Uh, the second one, Goodyear looked at it and they thought they might have had a little problem there, they weren't sure. Uh, Rick 
head. Did he have two also? Two. This Rick, is the and first this, one. The second one, as we'll see later, is pretty neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty neat. It was really neat from where I was sitting. Yeah. You just missed Pit Road. You could see him trying to get down on Pit Road there, and all the guys going on the apron trying to miss him and uh, to go around uh, an extra lap. That uh, radial tire flapping around in there causes major problems, too, when you blow one out or cut one down and then you try to get back to the pits because you got that rubber flapping around in there and it breaks stuff. How's that? Break stuff, Rick. You, you know what I'd stuff. really like to get to? Thursday I want to know, I want to know, <laughs> who do we have Thursday night? Because Thursday this is about night. that time. We have the NASCAR Bush Series champion, wow. Jeff is he now? Is he going to actually Here, come to the studio? In the studio, in person. Wow. On yeah, this weekend, NASCAR. Are y'all going to open it up for uh, a live audience as well, like you usually do? Uh, the GM <laughs> fan forum would be the that's, extent of our live that's audience. That's what I Thank mean. You. Right. <laughs> Calls and questions for Bush Series champion Jeff Green at that phone number. The show is Thursday at 7 Eastern on Speed Vision. Please watch the Owensboro Kentucky name. I've just by, been informed by our esteemed producer that we are way, way late. So let's get right back to our review of the Duraloop 500 in Phoenix. After the Jeremy Mayfield problem on the green flag pit stop, Steve Park had the lead. <laughs> you think talking faster is going to make up that Yes, time? i got to get I'm... through this script. Okay. He gave it up to Jeff Burton on pit stops during the Rich Bickle caution. Burton and Rusty Wallace trading the lead from lap 148 to 248 when the race's fifth caution waved for Mr. Schrader. Yeah, I did that again. again. Yeah. Leaders That's pit. Jeff Burton will have a problem that will cost him the lead. They had a lug nut stick. Uh, they said the jack broke. Yeah, that's what I meant. Thank you. <laughs> Same difference. It you, was throw, you, know, I, you just throw this stuff out there and you see how much of it will stick. You know? like the jack worked fine. <laughs> the jack worked fine from my angle. I heard the stuck lugs, Mr. Rusty's uh, team did good. 63 laps to go again, as well as Jeremy ran on two <clears> tires <throat> earlier. Everybody took four. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess yep. two only worked good for Jeremy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good job, Johnny. On the restart from the yellow, <laughs> Ricky Rudd to took hurry. the lead from Rusty Wallace <laughs> and looked to be in pretty fine shape. This is lap 253. This is pretty wild racing. This was tight here. I know that I was thinking about that uh, during the costume. The fans must enjoy that racing because the cars are just right on top of each other. It's very exciting. Ricky Rudd looked. Like he was going to finally have his day, which they have run so good all year, mm. only to run into a little bit of problem. But I heard Jeff Burton's post-race comments. He said, I was going to catch him. He was. And mm -hmm. we'll get to that in a minute. All right. Do I, did I jump ahead too far? At, at the moment, you digress. <laughs> we'll get to that. I thought digress quickly. went backwards. Behind Ricky Rudd yeah. at I Jeff Burton. I did digress yesterday. <laughs> Not like we Sorry, did. excuse me. Go ahead, Alan. <laughs> Jeff Burton fell from first to sixth on his pit stop. He's worked his way back to second behind Ricky Rudd. Mm -hmm. He is catching Ricky. He's going to get to him, but it's going to be really close if he can pass him in the final laps. But then, wow, look at that's Mike. pretty neat. With 18 to go, look at old Mike over there. It becomes a non issue. I didn't. He had. He had. He had Rick up in the air. Watch out. Oh, Ricky. Man. Here comes but look Mike. at Mikey Walter. We got X. five looks at this, so we'll see plenty okay. of Okay, look at this. No, no faster than I was going. It was pretty easy to get through there. <laughs> <laughs> Watch Jeff Burton man. come through. You see Kevin LePage. Now here comes Burton, the winning pass. Well, I shouldn't say the wow. winning pass. Yeah, that wasn't fair. Yeah. Wow. Well, you can say that. That's, that's, that's okay, it. now. See, let me explain this because I was in it. I'm on the outside. I see Rick Volatari. He's coming across. I know I can't get under him because Bliss didn't make it, so I stayed to the outside and they went mm. over that way. Let's see it for my car, Alan. <laughs> How about Rick Bass about Rick? first? Uh, this is the real telling view of what happened. He's not gonna. He's not gonna see anything. Right Whoa, front flat. Oh, right front right. flat. Yeah, but you can see what threw him back out into the middle of the track. Watch, he gets to the bottom through traffic here. Now he tries to hug the inside when he goes around the dog leg. You but can't, it won't it turn. Can't it blew out all the way. It went down. That's where. That's right where it blew out. You can see the defender shutter there. I now can't we can look at it from all he hit him. Now watch. This is pretty cool. <clears throat> Check this out. It's all about him. It's, yeah, all about it's all about Mike. This is me here coming off the corner. Yeah, There's Ricky Rudd. It's all about Mike. I see right over there. Plus, it's just you can't see. Oh, just yeah. like Ooh, we talk about every week. Wow. That was just. Did we mention it was bad for Ricky? Yeah. Rick. Hopefully, at some point, somebody will. Yeah. I'm just glad I took the Husqvarna yeah. camera right into the, to the <laughs> pit fire, or what do you call it? The war zone. The war zone. I carried the Husqvarna camera into the war zone okay, come to on. show people what happened, by gosh. Ricky Rudd, we high five yesterday. On that. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Ricky Rudd looking in position to win is taken out. Inside the final 20 laps, he winds up finishing 37th. Everybody pits under the caution except Mark Martin. He stays on the racetrack to take the lead. He had nothing to lose. He was, wasn't even going to get a top 10 finish out of it. Uh, everybody gets two tires this time. Everybody got two. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Now why didn't, uh, so why didn't, what do I know and accept, uh, elected to get four there? I did. Felt like two is better. <laughs> <laughs> You're the experts, beats me. Well, I guess I put everybody on the same playing field with everybody just getting two tires and I was just I don't think Mark Scamble was bad to stay out. No, no, he was, he was struggling all day and, and to stay out, what the heck, you know, there wasn't, wasn't only about 12 laps to go and Mark, as good as he is, he was just going to hang on to that thing for as long as he could and still ended up pretty good. Putty Rusty, gotta, beat, Rusty gotta, beat Jeff Burton off pit road. Burton goes to the outside to get Rusty for second and then Mark for the lead. Yeah, he was yeah, fast. He, he was good. If you were saying, one. Mike, I just had to get that point in while the video was appropriate. And he's sitting there with five to go leading the race because of the call that they made, you know. So that, that tells you that it was a great call for his team. He did lose a few positions in the last couple of laps. But uh, just think that if there had been another one of those big wrecks with four or five to go, he's got his car in the lead and would have pulled off a win. So a great call by his team and a good job by Mark to stay out there on those old tires and, uh, and keep it up to the, toward the front. That race pays good. Jeff oh. Burton's fourth win of the year, first at Phoenix, 12 different winners in 13 Phoenix races. The only repeat winner has been... Davey Allison, no one's ever won for Nepal. And um, what about that finish for Dave Blaney? <laughs> yes, yes, very, very good. good. Career very best. Really good. Yep. He gets better every week. Yes, eighth place. very good. Uh, Bobby Labonte, a solid fifth place run, ran in the top five all day, fell back on the next to last run of the race. Then after that last two tire stop, came charging back up to fifth. Dale Earnhardt, 31st to ninth. And you see Rudd there ending up in 37th spot. Tough day for him. Championship standings, Bobby Labonte's lead from 201 to 218 points over Earnhardt, 226 over Burton. We were talking on the airplane, Mikey and I think we could drive Ron home now with two races and 218 points. Yeah, we, think we, can, we think we can do it. <laughs> if Bobby leads by 185 or more at the conclusion of the Homestead race, he will get the ring in the next to last race of the season. Park up to 11th. Bill Elliott holding on to 20th. Michael Waltrip, roving reporter, next. Back on NASCAR Inside Winston Cup. Instead of a hot seat this week, Michael asked for and received a camera crew to go out and file another roving report. Here it is. Thanks, guys. I'm here at the, the, the showroom at Dora Incorporated. We were here a couple of weeks ago making our announcement that I'm going to drive the Napa Chevrolet in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series in 2001. Uh, added a couple more pieces to the puzzle. Uh, first of all, Sealy Furniture is an associate sponsor on our car. We've got them on the side of the race car now, and uh, just proud to have those folks abo aboard. Um, J.B. Davis, Jeff Davis, all the guys down there at um, Klausner Furniture have been real instrumental in, uh, in putting Sealy on the side of our car. I'm real happy about that. Um, we need a number. We hadn't announced our number yet. There's a lot of numbers around here. I'm, I'm walking around trying to figure out what I'm going to do, where I'm going to pick my number from. You got the three car, uh, which, which they uh, raced in Bush and, and Dale Jr. won championships with. Of course, Park's car, the one. And then you have the eight that Dale Jr. drives now in the Budweiser car. Hornaday won championships in the 16 truck. So I had all these options. You know, there's lots of numbers out there. I couldn't, couldn't figure out exactly what I wanted to do. So uh, I was thinking, I was thinking, and, and when it came right down to it, I was told that it didn't matter what I wanted to do. It wasn't my choice. So uh, we need to find Dale, figure out what he's going to put on the side of this thing. Well, this is it, the Napa Chevrolet that I'll be driving in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series in the 2001 season. And as you can see, um, we're unveiling our number. And I'm standing here with the car owner, or one of the two car owners of this, this team. Uh, and I was going to ask Dale, how did we come about number 15? Well, we talked about it, uh, you know, Napa and myself and uh, NASCAR were seeing what was available. And when the 15 was uh, one of the possibilities, that was an excitement for me because I drove the 15 for Bud Moore. A lot of history behind it with, with Bud Moore. And uh, so I think uh, it's a great number, lucky number, I think. Plus, you'll look good in Victor Lane, you know, so. But it has, it's got some history. I've won with that number with Bud Moore. And, and um, since Bud's retired and gone, you know, it's great sort of maybe to carry the history of that 15 number on. 
Yeah, I remember uh, a couple of exciting wins in the old Wrangler Ford there with the 15 on the side of it. And, and I can't help but that keeps coming to my mind when, uh, when I think you turned over in number 15 up there at Pocono too, did you? Yeah, Tim Richmond and I went off down and won and the brakes went out on the 15 and I went up over Tim and hit the wall and tore the car all to pieces, broke my leg. Had a lot of fun there for just a few minutes and uh, it was an exciting time. But uh, one Darlington in 82 that I can remember vividly, that was just a great day. The car just ran super, super good. I was standing in Victor Lane there with Bud Moore and it was just a great day. But uh, Bud kept telling me not to drive so hard, and I said, Bud, I'm not. I'm taking it easy. And he said, well, you're going faster. Every time he'd say that, he'd well, you keep going faster. I said, well, I'm taking it easy. Anyway, it's got a lot of history. And I think uh, your brother even drove this number for Bud. And, uh, of course, Bobby and Benny, Bobby Allison, Benny Parsons, uh, a lot of great people have drove for Bud more in this number. So it's got a lot of history, and it's got a lot of um, uh, maybe, like I say, a little luck that we can carry on here and get you in Victor Lane with it, and uh, we'll look good. Well, uh, the, the, the best memory of, of Dale in the 15 was when he won, won Darlington, like you said, hauled the mail that day. Uh, Daryl's best story that I ever heard about when he drove number 15 was the first day he drove us up at Richmond, like in 75, and coming off four, he got involved in a major crash. I mean, there was cars scattered everywhere, and Daryl was getting ready to get out of the car, and that's when they first started having radios in Winston Cup racing, and Daryl's car was on fire, and Daryl was trying to get out, and he said, Bud, come on the radio, and he said, Boy, at least get that radio out of there before you come out of there. Bring that. Don't let it burn up, too. So Daryl walked out with the radio, at least. And uh, But uh, he, he had some great stories about Bud. And, man, you know, I got to drive for the Wood Brothers. And, and uh, that's an important part of our sport, the history that those guys have. They're, they're the reason why we're here today. Well, that's true. The history behind these numbers and uh, the car owners that's been in it. And uh, hopefully I'm, we're making some history, Earnhardt Incorporated, and, uh, with, uh, of course, Park with the Pennzoil car and Dale Jr. with Budweiser. And now you with the Napa guys here in the 15 number. And Napa, you know, this company's had a great relationship. We had the 16 truck that won the championships and the three Bush car that won races. So the all the guys have won races with the Napa car, no matter what number. So, you know, Mike, you gotta, you gotta carry on with this Napa tradition. The, the, the number's different and it's a new deal. You gotta be in Victor Lane. Can you see the theme of Dale and I's conversations mostly here lately? They're, they're reminding me that, uh, this stuff is right you know we got we got a great race team and and uh, I, I gotta win and uh, I like that feeling well this is her old number 15 sunk right down in this baby I like it you like it you like my number there's a lot of history to the number like Dale said uh, it's important to remember our past and and, uh, and the, the people that helped us get here and, and Bud Moore is definitely an important part of the history of this sport and so uh, when you see me in 15 uh, it'll have a couple of meanings for me it'll be a fresh new start with a great team uh, driving an Apple Chevy with a number 15 on the side of it then there's also a reminder of me of the importance that uh, the people that have paved the way for us to race today such as Bud Moore guys like Junior Johnson the Wood Brothers all those folks and so um, I'll think of that number in a couple of different ways and that's, that's an exciting feeling Okay, a couple of observations here. Let's First of all, him. not that I care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've been promising you'd get Dale Earnhardt on our show. And I did. But then you make fun of me for doing guests by satellite and not having them here in the studio. You go and take a camera to Dale instead of having him come here to the studio. Well, you took a camera all the way to Daytona so Mark would talk to you on your show. Satellite, live. Same thing. <laughs> point counterpoint. I just think it's back a, me up here, Kenny. Come on. I just think it's great that, that I'm going to be drive. And I'm I'm serious that I'm going to I'm going to. That's important to me that I'm going to drive 15 because I like to think about our history. Number numbers are neat, especially yeah. in this sport, like you were saying. Because, man, I mean, some of the car owners and and Bud, especially with that 15. I mean, he's one of the pioneers of the sport, and that number is just supposed to be there. And now <laughs> to be with a team like Dale's pretty neat. I mean, even if Mikey's driving. <laughs> <laughs> can't, have, can't have everything. Oh, well, there'll be uh, history uh, made there, uh, I'm uh, sure. <laughs> but but you're not going to deliver Dale live for us like you promised. I can, but uh, I'm going to wait till one Monday when uh, 
Maybe you and Schrader aren't here. Can do it. <laughs> yeah. but Schrader's a smart aleck, and you're kind of the same way. And I don't want to bring the seven-time champion all the way down from Mooresville to sit here. All the way down from Mooresville. <laughs> sit here and listen to the all. Besides that, you don't want us to ask him, what the <laughs> heck were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Hire Mike. Job security. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, the NASCAR Bush Series race from Phoenix. We'll review it next. Don't go away. This week's Castro Flashback Fact takes us back to November 6, 1988, when Alan Kowicki gets his first career NASCAR Winston Cup victory in the Duraloop 500 at Phoenix. He then proceeds to introduce the fans to his Polish victory lap. NASCAR Inside Winston Cup is brought to you in part by the motor oil that provides maximum protection. Castro GTX, drive hard. And Hooters Restaurants, delightfully tacky yet unrefined. Mikey ran a little long with his exclusive unveiling of his number for next year, so we've got to hustle through the Outback Steakhouse 200 for the NASCAR Bush Series at Phoenix on Saturday. I won't talk Nine lead changes time. among seven drivers, and only one caution. Only had one in the Bush Series race there last year, too. Yeah. So two Bush Pretty Series good. races at Phoenix, two caution flags. Story of this race, dominance by Jeff Burton, with a youngster being his closest challenger. Jason Leffler started on the pole. Jeff Green was second, Jeff Burton third after Ron Hornaday led briefly. Leffler went out in front, then Burton overtook him, and that was kind of the pass for the win right there. Look at there. Leffler <laughs> shot her back on the inside. He, <laughs> he had a great car. That car looked really good on the racetrack, and he did a, a super job hanging up toward the front. Watch Burton's line entering turn one. All weekend, he took a wider arc into the corner than everybody did. You'll see it when he comes down here this time. Why? Well, maybe we should look at that. There might be something to it. You know, he had a pretty good weekend. <laughs> he sure did. You can see right there, he's not tucked right down on the bottom of the racetrack, like you said, Alan, just kind of running the middle of the road. All weekend, sure. both cars. Mm -hmm. Wish we'd known that Thursday, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can put that on your Thursday show next time, so we'll be reminded of it. The only caution of the race <laughs> happened at lap 49. It happened to Joe Nemechek, and it was a similar problem to what we saw several experience Sunday. Was there ever a, a definitive answer as to, he, to why? He said he had a, a tire problem, and he, and he said mm. the bad part was is he thought he felt it a little bit coming off four, and he wiggled the car down a front stretch, and then when it come time to slow him down, he said, man, I just couldn't get slowed down. And he bumped the wall and, and bent it up just a little bit. It seemed like it. most all the tires gave everybody a warning. You know, you didn't see anybody just barrel down in the corner and hit the wall. The, the Schraders, it went down a little bit. He was able to back off Rick Masson. Same thing with Nemechek. He knew something was going on but it was a little bit too late to save it. <laughs> you got a warning. Sometimes it's real good. It's like, oh, I know I'm going to hit the wall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'd rather just hit it, you know, not know it. Timing of the caution flag and subsequent pit stops left 150 miles to run. <clears throat> and some people took a little different strategy at that point. Some people, instead of going the 90 laps that you could get on the tank of fuel and then stopping for the rest, chose to split the 150 right in half. Kenny Wallace will be our illustration. He stops at lap 125, ran 75 laps, has got 75 to go. That's just a, a strategy call. The, the, the thing is, you could run about 110 laps in that uh, actuality on a tank of fuel with those cars. And so you're taking a chance that some cat will stay out there for another 35 laps after you, and the caution might fall and you wind up a lap down. But uh, with the history of the race, you got to take that into consideration. You don't see many cautions there, so it's good to get the fresh tires on there and split it up half and half. Whoa. Whoa. That That's close. would be what cost Jason Leffler his chance to stay close to Jeff Burton. That and the fact that he missed pit road the first time he tried to come to it. He slowed down, wasn't going to get there, got sped back up again. He did not go over the line there. No, he squared No, but he just, but when he came in, he kind of had his guys had to scramble for a second to get yeah, in. Yeah, he gained, he I'll gained, bet you. he got in good. Yeah, that's exactly right. He, he got it in good. He didn't leave nothing laying there. You know what he did? He kind of slid in and said, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Probably missing pit road hurt him more. Than right. That, yeah. That was a good yeah. stop he yeah, made. Yeah, you were wrong there, Alan, but go ahead. Well, he did a 17-7 <laughs> and Burton did a 15 something. Yeah, that was the pit stop, though. They were, wasn't, hey, don't argue with he him. He gained it getting in. 
We are led pretty much unchallenged from that point to the finish. Lap 145 to the lap 200 checkers. I'm trying to entice some expert analysis out of this group let me have, today. Let me have the next piece. Which Tell has me. been... Three to go. You can handle it. Take it on home. <laughs> let, me, let me have this. Okay. We'll go. Okay, here's the deal. Burton caught traffic, race traffic heavy, which is a few laps ago. And there you can see Leffler. He's closing in in a hurry, catching catching Burton. Making up from that pit stop. Exactly. <laughs> but might I ask how you'd know this? Because <laughs> at this point... I was right behind him. Okay. Five laps behind yeah, him. Yeah, well. But I was right behind him. <laughs> I was right on Bert, or right, oh, okay. 18's tail watching oh, all this. I think Jeff okay. was just being cautious and making sure he didn't. Of course he was, Johnny. That's a great That's right. point. <laughs> Jeff Burton's fourth win in 13 Bush Series races this season. Sweeps the weekend at Phoenix. Jason Leffler, terrific day. Best really career good. run in a Bush really Series car. Day. Did a great job all day. With the second place finish, Jeff Green finished fourth, his 24th top five in 31 races. Simply amazing. And on the old rundown sheet, the last car listed as running, Mike, was the Band-Aid Chevy. Well, we've changed two sets of tires and uh, we had problems with both. It was not a performance <laughs> issue as much as it was that... Uh, oh, yeah, I remember. They didn't go well, the pit stops, that is. One race to go in the Bush Series season. The closest race is going to be for third, with Kevin Harvick leading Todd Bodine by just five points. The Bush Series at Homestead Saturday. This week's Pep Boys Tip of the Week. Since the heating system works off the same coolant that circulates throughout your engine, performing an antifreeze flush and fill can also prevent overheating, the most common cause of breakdowns and internal engine damage. It's time for question of the week now, and Cindy Seaberger of Linden, Michigan, wants to know, why does the truck series have to finish a race under the green while the Bush and Winston Cup races can end under the caution? Survey says... I think I know. The, the truck races started out being like two half races, and like, if you think about Winston Cup, you think about the Daytona 500. You can't make it the Daytona 501. There's too much stuff that goes into winning the Daytona 500. To, to, to extend it for any reason. And so NASCAR Winston Cup and Bush races, they're 300 milers, they're 500 milers, and they're all those advertised distance, and that's the distance they wanted them to go. Well, they started the truck series and they did it a little bit differently. And so therefore, they felt like it was okay to let those races go a few extra laps because um, because of the, the format of the races, the way they were laid Fuel out. Fuel mileage wasn't going to be a factor. No, because they were going to stop and get gas at halfway. And, then, and so they started out that way, and they've just never changed it because it was popular with the fans. But the fans also need to understand and appreciate the fact <laughs> that the Daytona 500 needs to be the Daytona 500. There's a lot of things. Daryl Waltrip won the Daytona 500 on fuel mileage one day. And I know you're going to say, okay. oh, I almost won it. <laughs> put, <laughs> put, put, put the camera on me and let's see what kind of reaction shots they give each other for a minute. No. Yeah. no. See, I thought you I had a good answer, Mike. That, yeah. okay that was a good that? answer. That was good. That was a good answer. Yeah, I believe I thought was I did. all over it. Yeah. Did he answer anything go. through that hole? Well, yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. He did good. He did real good. You Re can't the review, it. review it for me, Schrader. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> These guys run this fuel mileage down to the very last little deal. And all of a sudden to be finishing the 200 lap, 500 mile at Daytona 500. And it's like, oh, we got to run green, white checker and you don't have fuel. I just can't do it. Okay, answer is because. Yes. We'll come back and preview <laughs> Homestead next. If you have a question for our drivers, mail it to Question of the Week, Post Office Box 240417, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28224, or email us at speedvision.com. Tony Stewart in Victory Lane. After winning the Pennzoil 400 in Homestead one year ago, the NASCAR Winston Cup Series makes its second run at the Mile and a Half South Florida track this Sunday, and we attempt to preview it now with our expert panel. We start with a drive around. The Homestead Miami Speedway. Wow! Down front straight away. Long, 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 long. And you would think you'd use a lot of brake, but you don't have to use near as much brake as you can, but you want to hug that inside. And you want to definitely stay right down on the bottom. Sometimes, as you can see, you get underneath the white line there, and just normal deal. Push right out to the wall. Another long straightaway, and like Kenny says, man, you don't use half as much brakes that you think you're going to. And I think the reason why is because that's such a wide sweeping corner. You know, we're used to these little 
the tracks that are flat like Homestead is being a mile in length and so the corners are a lot tighter but this place is real sweeping and so uh, you just try to hug the bottom of the racetrack and, and uh, roll through the center of the corner the best you can and that's pretty much a lap around that joint. We saw it a great race there last year between the two teammates, <laughs> um, Stewart and Labonte and, and, and it was exciting as the last pit stops took place, they shot off pit road or, or uh, Stewart was on pit road and Bobby was coming around the track and they diced it up there. Just a real, real neat place to go racing and uh, a lot of fans in that South Florida area that, and you, you wonder where they all come from. <laughs> Jeez. I'm getting to get my second win. Yeah. You ever wonder like where they all, but when you fly in down there, there's a lot of people live down there. I don't know if y'all realize that or not. I was going to say something, but well, I'll save it for next week. You, did, you took a breath in like you were going to inject something. Yeah, there, I'll get it next week. It probably wouldn't be something we're going to be distraught that we miss. <laughs> no, is that what it is? <laughs> Anything else to add about Homestead? No. I'll be at my souvenir trailer if you need to see me. Every, it seemed like everybody went down there and tested. Yeah. And like we talked last week. So it'll be an interesting race this year. Okay. We'll come back. You still got a, a souvenir minute. trailer. <laughs> selling half for five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the weekend calendar. It's the Bush Series finale at Homestead Saturday. Bobby Labonte tries to lock up the Winston Cup title Sunday in the Pennzoil 400. Thursday, 7 Eastern, Jeff Green, the Bush Series champions on this week in NASCAR on Speed Vision. Next Monday, we'll see if they let us come back and review it again. <laughs> Um, Mikey was talking about his souvenir trailer on the way to the break. We took this picture out at Phoenix on Saturday. Ah, look at there. Yeah, oh, but you can't Mike, tell whose trailer it's at. Wait, wait, wait. The, this is at Mikey's trailer. There are all these people gathered around his trailer, three and in this whole picture we count get the old three Michael Waltrip hats, and that's it. Well, that's because they got them in their hands. The other hand. We counted the whole picture. The other hand. <laughs> <laughs> Put that hand down and raise the other hand. It'll have a hat in it. We're selling the crap out of souvenirs. I'm telling you, that. <laughs> it's, it's a going they're, out of they're business going sale. They're going out. We're having a going out of business sale. The first uh, week of it was oh. in Phoenix, and we're going to continue it at Homestead this continue. weekend. So if you need a new hat and you don't want to pay much for it, <laughs> Johnny, my trailer. You didn't get in at the end of last week's show. Got anything you want to say? Oh, no. Nah, going to go do a photo shoot for Valvoline this week before we go down to Homestead, and looking forward to the last two races of the year. And you? I'm just. Anxiously waiting for Thursday's show. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go take pictures too for Napa. We told you at the beginning of the program Tomorrow. we would apologize yeah. for this show. It I got think better. It, it got thing better. To do. It started out bad. NASCAR Inside Winston Cup has been presented by Pep Boys. Cars like us, people love us. Drivers and Crew Apparel is provided by Chase Authentics, the authentic trackside apparel of NASCAR. New for all race fan families. Introducing the Simpson Child Car Safety Seat. Available now at these racing places. For more information, visit our website at SimpsonRaceProducts.com. For more of the latest NASCAR news and information, log on to SpeedVision.com.